Hi, welcome to the next video on natural draft cooling towers. I've gone to the website, there's two different types of cooling tower. This one here is a counter flow hyperboloid tower or natural draft cooling tower. And the one below that is a cross flow hyperboloid tower. Now what we're going to do is we're going to go to the full screen model now. And we're going to have a look exactly what these towers are and how they function. A model's loading now, it takes a while because it's quite a big model and there's a bit of scenery. And there we go. Now typically you'll see these towers next to power stations. That's because they're very efficient when they're under constant load, which means they need to supply constant cooling for a certain process. Many people believe these are only used for nuclear power stations, but that's not true. They're also used for coal fired power stations. I'm guessing most people have seen these towers before, and that's because they're quite colossal in size. They can be up to 200 meters high and 100 meters in diameter at the base. Normally they'll be constructed from reinforced concrete or steel, and although they're very efficient, they're also very costly. So you'll only see these where there's going to be a constant load or a constant cooling requirement for many, many years. So this tailors well for the power industry particularly nuclear power stations or coal-fired power plants, etc. It wouldn't be as good for other industries where the cooling requirement is not so high and five years later the plant might shut down. Towers such as this are required for cooling down steam exhaust. Now normally for a power station you have steam exhaust passing into a condenser. Then the cooling water will cool down the exhaust steam and turn it into condensate and then this condensate can be pumped back to the boiler where it will be heated up again, turned to steam and go to a turbine. The cooling water though, which cools down the steam, will return to the cooling tower and the heat will be taken away by air. Now this whole funnel shape, the whole tower is designed to induce air into the base and expel air at the top. This is called a stack effect, hot air rises and that's the whole principle behind the tower. The unique shape is there because it saves on materials when building, but it also accelerates the upward convection of hot air. So it's going to expel the air quicker. This raises the overall efficiency and also allows a much higher rate of cooling. We can see three pipes on this side. Two of them are small and one of them is large. We'll just zoom in a little bit further here and get a look at the two lower pipes, the ones that are a little bit smaller. This one here is a discharge pipe from the water basin. And what's happening here is the water is being sucked from the basin, there's a hole over here, underneath the concrete and it comes out of the pipe here. This will then connect to a pump house and the pump house will pump the cooling water to the power station, specifically to the condenser. The second pipe here is the cooling water return. This pipe will be slightly warmer and this is going to go inside to a sprinkler system which we're going to have a look at in a minute. And if we go further up the tower, we can see here this large black pipe. Not all cooling towers will have this large black pipe, but it's actually for expelling flue gas. We're going to talk about that later as well. So let's go back and we'll have a look at the cross section of a counterflow cooling tower. Again, this might take a couple of seconds to load up, but I'm sure it'll be worth it. So now you can see we've taken a cross section of the cooling tower, about a quarter of it's missing. And we can see that the black flue gas pipe here, this is coming from the boiler. So coal will be burnt, the exhaust gas will run into the pipe along here and then be expelled out of the centre of the cooling tower. The reason for this is because expelling the flue gas out of the cooling tower actually saves a bit of money. You don't need to build a separate stack for the flue gas if you can expel it out of this cooling tower. So that's what they do, and also the flue gas is relatively warm. It will draw up through the tower, and then cooler air will also be drawn in to replace that which is displaced. The cooler air will be drawn in here at the base. We can see these grooves here, or this empty space. That's where the cool air rushes in, and the hot air rises and expels through the top. If we keep going down, we can see the two pipes we talked about earlier. We can see the piping here, the suction here to the, one of the feed water pumps to the condenser. And then the discharge here coming back. 
So the water here from the water basin is relatively cool, or is, is cooler than the water coming back through this pipe, should I say. And it will draw down here, go to the condenser, come back slightly warmer, maybe 10 degrees, maybe more, who knows, depends on the system. Come back and then it will be distributed to a sprinkler system or a nozzle system. Now what happens here, you can see all the nozzles, they're all laid out in a pattern. But the water will come down through the pipe, spray out of these nozzles, and a circular spray pattern is what falls then onto this part here. This part here is called fill. The fill itself is more or less a heat exchanger. The idea with the fill is that you can spread the water out over a larger surface area and more water will come into contact with air. This increases the efficiency and also increases the heat transfer rate. The water then comes out of the fill and will drop into a water basin, which is this area here, the whole grey area. That's the path that the warm water takes out here through the nozzles, sprayed onto the fill, through the fill. The air is rushing in the opposite direction, and then it's going to, the air will get warmer, and then the air will rise. The water will just drip down back into the basin, and in order to reduce losses, we have here what's called a drift eliminator. The drift eliminator has a pretty strange shape. The idea is that you don't want to lose any cooling water. Now a lot of cooling water, if you didn't have this drift eliminator, would drift, more or less, out of the cooling tower. But we don't want that to happen. We want to expel the heat as air, but we don't want to expel the heat with the water. We have to replace the water, and sometimes this can be quite expensive. So what we do, we have this weird shape here, and any water droplets that come out here, they'll impinge upon the drift eliminator, condense, and then drip back down into the water basin. So we can reduce our losses by quite a lot there. Normally, for a tower like this, your losses should be less than 1%, and this means that you don't need to take so much from your water source, which might be city water, unlikely, but it could also be a lake or a river, which is much more likely. If we go back up to the flue gas exhaust here, the main reason that you'll only see this on modern power stations is because you cannot normally just discharge flue gas here and out the cooling water tower. The reason is you'll get the exhaust gas mixing with the condensate or the, the plume, the water plume that comes out of the tower, and this creates a very corrosive environment. Now you obviously don't want this, so you'll only ever see this installation or this kind of setup for a modern power station where they have some form of flue cleaning, particularly desulfurization, and then it's safe for the flue gas here to exit without the entire environment here becoming corrosive and the corrosive gases then eating away at the cooling tower. These gases will actually mix with the water droplets and cause something very similar to acid rain, so that's absolutely something that you do not want within this space. If we go back down now, we can have a quick look at the water basin. The water basin is just a space really where you can store a relatively large amount of water. There has to be a good head of water here because the pumps, which are quite large, are going to be drawing from the reservoir. The reservoir itself needs to be dosed with biocide, mainly to prevent bacteria growth and Legionnaire's disease. Legionnaire's disease has been found on a couple of cooling towers in the past. And what happens is you have Legionnaire's bacteria here within the water basin and it will be drawn out through the water plume and expelled out of the cooling tower. So we'll go back up here and the Legionnaire's disease or the bacteria itself will be expelled here and then this goes into the atmosphere. Unfortunately this is not very good if you live nearby. I believe the last time this happened was in France and about 21 people died. So that's essentially how the whole cooling tower works. The stack effect, drawing cool air in here, the air gets heated up by the water as it's sprayed down onto the heat exchanger here, or the fill. And then the hot air rises, this in turn also draws more cooler air in. And then the process continues and continues in order that the power station and the turbine can stay online. But unfortunately it's not always that simple. These towers might be built in areas with sub-zero conditions. This essentially means that the water is going to freeze. 
There's too much water here to dose it with antifreeze or something similar. So what many plants try and do is regulate the water temperature so that it's approximately 4 or 5 degrees as it exits towards the pumps. This means the entire basin should ideally be above 4 or 5 degrees and therefore you can prevent freezing. There are other things that can be done in winter. One of them is to drain the tower down. This obviously prevents any freezing because there's no water in the tower anymore. Another method is to heat the water basin, although this is a slight loss of energy. But generally all these problems with winterization, and they've been overcome, usually just using a bit of ingenuity. Just going to go back out now, we're going to have a look at a different type of tower. It looks very similar, but it's slightly different. This one is called a cross-flow hyperboloid tower. The principle is more or less the same, but it looks slightly different at the base. The same components are going to be used as before. The spray system, fill and drift eliminators, as well as the tower shape itself, which is more or less the same. You can see now the model's just loaded up. If we have a look at the suction and discharge, the suction is here again from the reservoir. Let's go to the pump house and the power station. The discharge is through here. This is slightly warmer. It's going to be discharged through the nozzles onto the fill, which is a heat exchanger for more or less. Oh, apologies, I've gone a little bit too far there. So it sprays onto the fill, will drip down. The air will increase in temperature and pass through the drift eliminators and then into the tower and up through the tower. The water itself will drop down through the fill and into the reservoir. Any water droplets that are going out with the air will condense here on the drift eliminator and then drip back down into the reservoir. And because the air is slightly hotter than the air above or at the top of the tower, it's going to rise up through the tower and as it rises up it's going to draw even more cooler air in through the grills, through the fill and then through the drift eliminator. And the process continues and continues. So anyway, I hope that gives you a good overview of how cooling towers work. There's a bit more information on the website, so if you want to check it out, feel free.